we come before you this morning to study the truth, we ask that you give Brother Parminder words of wisdom and that you would hide him behind the cross of Christ. Help him to show forth your glory through his understanding of your word. Please forgive us of our sins, Lord, and help us to be attentive and understanding. In Jesus' name, amen. I've noticed that when you're trying to defend or explain this message, It takes a long time to do it. And part of the problem is, not because it's complicated, but because there's so much information, you can't do it all in one go. So when you begin to set up the logic to come to your conclusion, it takes sometimes many hours, if you're going to do it thoroughly, to put everything in place before you come to your conclusion. <clears throat> I think Americans use the term, you put all your ducks in a line, in a row. In a row. Um, and there's another phrase that when you get to the end, uh, you're going to have the punch line. So that, that's kind of terms that people use here. There's a nice French term that I'm familiar with, which I, quite, I use quite often. It's called a coup d'etat. Now, I don't know if you've heard about the term coup d'etat, but coup d'etat is different to a punchline. So what do people, how do people understand the word punchline when you get to your punchline after you set up all your ducks in a, in a row? What, what does that mean when you, when you get to the punchline? Yeah? I, I understand it to mean a conclusion. You come to your conclusion. Yeah. It's like the icing on the cake. And everybody should be happy. Everybody should be happy when you get to your conclusion. Does anybody know what a coup d'etat is? Because it takes you to the same place. I've always understood a coup d'etat as like a rebellious, you know, you're taking over someone else's thing. Or, yeah, you know. that's exactly what it is. And it's exactly what it is, you take it over. And I've noticed, when I've engaged with people over the years, and you can get someone who's going to be interested enough to sit with you for long enough to go through all that preliminary work to get to the conclusion, to the punchline, what often happens is they forget all of the, all the ducks. They forget all the preamble and in, in, often they just shut down when you're giving all the preamble. They're just sitting there waiting, whether it's an hour study or f two days or at, whatever it is, the whole prophecy school even. They, sh they shut down and they're waiting for the answer at the end. And when you give the punchline, sometimes people get shocked and they get concerned about what you're saying. And instead of it being a punchline, what it ends up being is a coup d'etat. And it's happened so often, I've just come to the realisation that whenever you're going to come to a conclusion or something, it ends up being a coup d'etat. And the coup d'etat is when the minority faction takes control of the majority situation. Now, often when you use this term, it's, it's, it's in the term of a military or a small minority of the government, they're going to, they're going to take over the country. And... In its normal usage, it's done surreptitiously, it's done secretly under the, under the radar. So when it happens, it comes as a big surprise and people don't realise what's happening. And they get very defensive and you get this huge clash. And the reason you get this problem is because people don't see it coming up. And the reason why I think often in this message we get coup d'etats happen frequently is because... People don't see the build-up. I think we should be spending 99% of our time in the build-up. But the problem is, and I hope... Sometimes I sense we have the same problem here, even, in, even amongst ourselves, even amongst friends. We spend so much time in the build-up, people get bored, they get distracted, they don't see the point, and they end up shutting down. So that when you come to the punchline, People suddenly wake up and think, 
how did you get that punchline? How did you get here? I got lost. And then I find, and I do this, have to do this all the time, you have to go back again, all the way to the beginning, and rebuild your picture. And halfway through that, people begin to shut down again. And it's this, this never-ending cycle. Now, I'm not saying that about what's, what, what's happening you know, with the students, that you're not listening, but I've noticed that it's, it's, it's a thing that we really need to guard against both when you're teaching and when you're listening, is that when someone spends an awful long time going through names, dates, places, and all of this build-up, they're doing it for a reason. And if you don't understand the reason they're doing it, when the punchline comes, you're gonna miss it. And instead of it coming a punchline, it becomes a coup d'etat. So, That was just my thought for the day. <laughs> I've got a thought on that. Go ahead. If I don't know where someone's going, my brain can has an autopilot switch that just says, well maybe this person's just spewing knowledge for knowledge's sake, and that's when I potentially can switch off. Oh, yeah, just in response to that, if you've ever done English, I was speaking to my brother yesterday about English and my dislike of English. When I was at school, they said, when you're writing a, um, a paper or a, 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 whatever you're doing, it says, you, this is how you do it, you, you, do, you split into three parts. First you tell them what you're going to say, then you tell them what you're going to, then you tell them what you're going to tell them, and then you end up by saying, you've to, you're going to retell them what you've already told them. So you do it three times. You do a preamble, the body, and, which is what you're saying. And I try and do that all the time. Hopefully you've picked it up when, when I'm presenting, that, um, when I'm teaching, that I'm going to tell you where we're going to. But I've noticed repeatedly it doesn't make any difference because people just shut down. And when you get there, it comes as such a surprise. People, it's like, didn't you listen at the, at the beginning when I told you where we're going? It, it just doesn't make, it doesn't make any difference. So... I don't know how to resolve the issue. You're all going to be teachers, so you're going to be faced with this same problem. You're supposed to tell people where you're going at the beginning, but you'll notice because of the technical aspects of this message, you need to be able to lay down you know, a really good foundation, and people just don't listen. And that's why you have to go through over things over and over again. I've been to a number of places, not just recently, in the past, and people have been on this message for a long time. And I don't know, we're probably going for about yeah, 18 months, coming up to two years, that we're beginning to understand, or we've understood, how we combine the first and second angels' messages. August 11th, 1840. April the 19th, 1844. And we're going to combine those two messages and bring them into 9-11. And I've already seen a couple of smiles this morning when I mention that, because people cringe when you do that. Because we, we, you know, we're pressing on with all this information and people are still not 100% happy with how you do that and how you can twist and turn and get these things to combine together and the reason and the logic behind it. And they're not happy with it. This is a big issue in this movement. And I find wherever I go, people want to talk about visions or they talk about the Book of Esther or the prediction. And at the back of all of this, people are still in their minds and not resolved on this issue about how you go about combining the two angels into a single angel and the significance of that and what it means. So when you get the punchline, people really struggle with it. So I, I really want to encourage you as students and as potential teachers that you need to labour with people. And when people don't get it the first time, you need to keep on going back over and over again. And if you're, if you're ever teaching at any, you know, any kind of group setting, be aware that there are people there who have been on the message for a long time and you've been asked to, to you know, present on the Book of Ruth or the Book of Esther or whatever the subject is, or Daniel 2 and the Repeat of the Kingdoms. You should know that you're going to be beating people there who have got gaps in their knowledge because they weren't paying attention or because they didn't pick it up. It wasn't taught correctly for whatever reason. <laughs> Um, it, it, it's an issue that comes up over and over again. 
So there are a couple of things I wanted, I wanted to talk about this morning. Um, some of them are related to what we've been discussing and some of them aren't. So the first one I want to pick up is, I was told, but I've got a very bad memory, that I said I was going to talk about a little, pe a little bit of information about the first day of the first month. So this is nothing to do with what we're studying, but one of the students asked me a question about the first day of the first month. I think it was done in class, but um, I forgot all about it. So the first day of the first month. Millerite history, this is April the 19th, 1844. So this has got nothing to do with the discussions of Daniel 11. This is just totally separate subject, but someone has asked questions, so I wanted to address it. Um, it's come up in previous discussions a number of times. So let me, where I'm, this is where I'm headed. Where I'm headed is to understand how, Millerite, how the Millerites got to April the 19th, 1844. How did they get there? Most people here, some people who are watching it on video may not be aware of it, but we understand about the calendations that the Millerites were grappling with. They are grappling with four calendars. They're grappling with a biblical calendar. And what I mean by biblical calendar, I mean the calendar that you're going to see in the book of Genesis. So, or, or, or a prophetic calendar, let me put it that way. When, when, we, when we do prophetic time, we're using a prophetic calendar. And in that prophetic calendar, you've got 360 days a year and you've got 30 days per month. So you've got that one calendar. Then, after the destruction of Jerusalem, the Jews when they were scattered through the world, they, partly by choice, partly by force, they began to change their calendar. After the second destruction. Sorry? The after the destru second destruction of Jerusalem, AD 70, I should have given the date, AD 70. Um, they, they're dispersed through the world, and they're going to begin to be forced to change their calendar because they don't live in Israel. And that force is going to make them reevaluate how they calculate the beginning of the year and they're going to do it solely through astronomical calculations through the sun and the moon. As time goes on, this, this problem gets established, it gets embedded. When the papacy rises up in 538, one of the first things that they do is they begin to, by force, um, make the Jews change their calendar and not use the calendar as described in the, I'll just say in the books of Moses, how he defines how you're supposed to begin the new year. And then around, I think, the 7th or 8th century, uh, an independent ministry, a sect of Jews, rise up in opposition to this work of the papacy, and they're called the Karaites. So we get this Karite reckoning, so we've got this biblical or prophetic reckoning, we've got Jewish reckoning or rabbinical reckoning, and now we've got this Karite reckoning. And then the papacy gave us our calendar from right back from Rome to the papacy to the time which we uh, live in. And we call that Gregorian time or the Gregorian calendar named after Pope Gregory. So we've got these four calendars to <coughs> grapple with. And when the Millerites were grappling with all these calendars, they were going to dovetail and combine all these things together. And most of us know that they're going to end up coming to the conclusion that this is how you start a new year. First of all, you go to the vernal equinox, which is around the 21st of March. And the vernal equinox, or the spring equinox, is where you get, in a 24-hour period, daytime and nighttime are equal lengths. It's 12 hours and 12 hours. So this is the vernal equinox and there's, there's a this is where the, the, the Hebrews, the Jews begin to calculate their year it, it, it's, it's primarily based on the vernal equinox in the spring because they're going to say you're going to start your year in the spring so a spring isn't just some kind of fuzzy term spring is, is, is controlled by the movement of the sun so that's the vernal equinox where you get 12 hours of sun uh, of daytime, 12 hours of night. Then you're going to look at the, the new moon. 
It's not actually the new moon, because the new moon is when you can't see. It's the first sliver of the new moon that's going to be associated with this. And they're going to look for a moon that's connected to this vernal equinox. So I'm going to put two moons here. And so this is one month, and then you get another month going through. And here's this first sliver of the new moon that we're seeing. And they're going to calculate, because this is an astronomical calculation, they're going to calculate before the event, way back here, they're going to be looking forward because they know when this is going to happen and they know when the new moons are going to strike, that they're going to see which new moon is the closest to the vernal equinox. So in this scenario, this is the nearest one. So this is how they're going to begin the first of the first month. This is rabbinical time, first day, first month. But when you're living in Palestine, in, in Judah, and this is your land, the glorious land, you're supposed to be offering the first fruit offering of the barley. So you need to, way back here, before you get to the 16th day of the first month, so we've got the first day of the first month, and obviously Passover is the 14th, then the first fruit offering is the 16th. So way back here, you need to be able to determine when you get to these cycles of the moon, the, the, the barley harvest that you've planted here, so back here, you've planted your barley, that you need to be able to ensure that by the time you get to the first of the first month, then two weeks later, that you're going to have barley here that's ripe. So you need to make sure that you, you're going to plant, and you can only plant according to the seasons, according to the cycle of the sun. So you've planted here, in anticipation of a barley harvest here. But you don't know what the weather's going to be like between this point and this point. So as you get closer to the end of the year, because this is the end of the year here, the 12th month, you're going to go into the first month, you're going to start looking at this barley. And you're going to start keeping a close eye on it. And they had people who were experts on barley. So they're looking at the barley as it's ripening. And back here, the priests, this is the Jews, this is back in ancient Israel, the Jews are doing this and it's the priests, this is the work of the priests, they've got specially trained priests who are experts in barley harvest and they've got, some, they've got specific fields surrounding Jerusalem, this is only in Jerusalem, they're not looking at the whole country, they've got specific fields that they've targeted that these people are going to look regularly and see how the barley is going and they're going to be checking it as you go along. So before you get anywhere near here, they're going to look at the barley and they're going to see the barley in this state here, right back here. And they're going to know this the barley's at this condition here, 50 days or two months or whatever in the future, they know at a certain time the barley will be ready by, by looking at it here. So what they're going to do is way back here, they're going to decide if this barley was, is going to be ready on the 16th day, then this, this, this moon here, this first day of the first month, this is the moon that they're going to choose. But they can look at this barley here, and they know that this barley, if you looked at this moon here, it won't be ready 16 days later. So what they'll do is, way before you get to the end of the year, they're going to say, we're going to skip a cycle, and this is going to be the moon. So this is going to be the first day of the first month. So they've added 30 days of growth, to the barley. So way back here, they're going to they're decide if it's going to be this moon or this moon, based upon what the barley looks like long before you get to the end of the year. So this is how Moses defined you're supposed to begin the new year. You're supposed to mark it off by the equinox, then the moon that's closest to it, but you need to keep an eye on the barley. And if the barley's not going to be ready, then you have to add an extra month on. So some years they have 13 months a year. I think it's called, uh, the, the last month is called, is it Adar? Yes. Mm -hmm. And it's called V or V, V Adar. It, it's something like yeah, an, an added 12. Yeah, so, um, the, yes. So I think it's every seven years out of 19 or something like that. Every two or three years, yeah. they're going to skip, they're going to do this. So that's how the Jews are supposed to be doing it. 
They've, they've been forced out of the country and they can no longer check if the barley is going to work or grow because no one's living in Jerusalem. Uh, the Karaites say, we're supposed to do this and I'm not 100% sure if you're a Karaite living in Poland, how you go about working out where you're going to start your new year. But when the Millerites tackle this issue, so coming back to Millerites, how they choose this date. Can you tell us again when did the Karaites start, uh, the, uh, the builders started their own it's, a, it's around 7th to the 8th century. So, so all they're doing is just, they're just going back okay. to what they're supposed to doing, what they're supposed to be doing. Um, it becomes, th there must have been lots of Jews on their own who were, who were following a different calendar. But you, will get, you get persecuted, you get banished, you get fined, imprisoned, if you don't keep a calendar that's in agreement with what the papacy is teaching. So you receive severe fines. So when it says he changed times and laws, I understand now that one of the things that we, when it talks about changing times is not just about what day you're changing. They, they, they're doing a concerted attack upon the calendation or biblical calendation for the very purpose of hiding the fact that when you get to the end of the world and Ezra 7 is going to start becoming present truth, you've got no idea which date you're going to go for. So in, so in 1844, you're either going to choose September the 23rd or you're going to choose October the 22nd. So you've got your clueless of which, what one to do. And it makes a difference. It, it really makes a huge difference. So coming back to Millerite history, as an example. Oh yeah. This way you line up. I'm not sure what a Karite in Poland would do. Yes, and that's what I'm saying. I'm not yes. sure how they go about. Re how about a real person in Europe is going to resolve this issue? How they how they're going to communicate this fact with some? There are some people who are living in Israel, and they're going to they're going to know when their hot body is going to be ripe in Jerusalem. But I don't know how they go about communicating this fact to the other people. To the other people. Now. You're going to check the barley a, a long while before you get to the end of the year. So whether or not they've got some ability, I, I don't know how long it takes. To, you know, it, it takes a few months, few, at least weeks, to get any kind of information from Israel to Europe in, in, the, in the Middle Ages. So I don't know how they go about doing that. But, they, but there's this conflict that's going on between Karite reckoning and rabbinical reckoning. The Millerites start doing a lot of research on this way before, way before um, March, let me put 1844 here. Long time before this, they already understand what this issue is about because they're getting challenged that why they've adjusted their calendar. Wait, there's an article back in June of 1843, the year before, yeah. where I first found J.B. Himes explains the difference between the rabbinical and carrier. When the Millerites on this chart have done all these mass calculations and they've got 1843, it's, I think it's really, really deceptive. I'm not saying they were deceptive, but it's deceptive to us without someone explaining what they're talking about. Because that 1843 actually means 1844. And they know that. It's the, the, the mistake, when we talk about the mistake is 1843, in 1844, it's not that obvious, it's not that black and white that they've got a 12 month mistake. This, ish, this date here is actually 1844, as you and I understand it. It's really 1844. Sorry? Gregorian. Yes. And they understood it that way too. That's the point I'm making. Because you, you get to the first, you get to the end of it. It's just that when you say Gregorian, if you go to all of these dates, these are all Gregorian dates. So I don't want to get into the complexities about Gregorian because they're, they're putting numbers down, but it needs someone, you need someone to explain the chart. You know, we have all these charts and all this information. You need a real-life teacher to explain these things. Um, if you don't, people get lost. You can't, expect, you can't expect a novice to look at this chart and understand what's going on. And that's why we make so many mistakes. Today, how we teach the charts, or, or a novice picks it up and, and they think they know what he's talking about. I understand all the other things that Gregorian except those, but I've never understood why they, why they did that, why, <coughs> why they, uh, you know, um, I, they did those I was speaking to Brother Michael the other day, and he and I, were, he was saying, he's looked at this, you can't find, he hasn't found, 
I don't think it's there. Like a, a, a document or a paper that a Millerite before 1844 is going to, it, it's a transcript of a sermon or, or a study that shows you him walking you through this chart. So we don't know how they would explain what's the information on this chart. So like part of the... Why they sorry? Like why they oh, I'm not saying they changed. The problem is you've got to, you've got to know how you're, going to, how you're going to put a lot of information on a sheet of paper. So we, you can explain that really simply if you've got a real-life person talking about it. But if, you, if the person goes and you've just got the paperwork with no notes... You're left to your own devices of what all of that means. And most Adventists, when they look at that, they just say, oh, they have a problem with the year zero, they don't understand about ordinal, ordinal and cardinal numbering, and we have all of this logic to do it. But, but what they're doing here, when the Millerites are talking about a year, this is this, this, is this whole combination of, of how they're combining these years, because 1843 to 1844... If this is December and this is January, we go from winter to winter, but they're going to go from spring to spring. And this is their 1843. And I can't prove that this is what a Millerite would say, but I think this is what they'd say. They'd say, we all know when we use Jewish reckoning, because they're, they're, they're preaching this chart long before they they realise the, the differences between Karite and Rabbinical Reckoning. But they're using Jewish Reckoning and they're going to say, we're going to use this Reckoning here and when they talk about 1843, they, they're telling you you're going to go to the spring of 1844. That's what that chart is teaching. It, it, it's teaching that. But the, those math calculations don't portray that. But I don't know how, the, I don't know how anybody... If you, if you want to start from scratch, how would we do it? So that, that's what they're doing, that's what I'm saying. You've got these numbers and they're going to explain it this way. <coughs> Brother Gabriel. So to what specific date were they referring to again on the 43 chart? So, so they're talking about from this here, from the spring of 43 to the spring of 44. That's, that's, that's their 1843. That, that's, that's the argument. And when they preach, they're not going to be specific about that. And that, the reason they're not going to be specific is because right back, right from top, William Miller is going to define the culture of the Millerites and how they preach, and he's not going to be specific. So if he's not going to be specific, everybody that, that, that cascades after him, they don't want to be specific either. They may have had their own opinions. They may have had their own thoughts that it's going to be at a certain time of that year, but they're just going to be general about this thing because that's what the chart teaches. But way before you get to, sometime around the spring, summer of 1843, there's already rumblings going on. This is the story of Samuel Snow, that they know, it's, he knows, or begins to realise he's not even going to be in the spring of 44. It's going to be in the autumn or the fall of that, but that's a different story. Um, so, coming back to, this, this, this point here. So I wanted to make sure that we understand that, that they're, they're like labelling the spring of 44, which is why they get the disappointment. So coming back to Millerite history, the Millerites have got the same problem as this Karite who lives in Europe. That how do, you, how do you go about working out when the first of the first month is really going to be according to Karite reckoning because you don't live in Israel to do that. And the logic that they use is this. They go through all the research and they say most of the time, most of the time, the Karaites are one month after the rabbis. So let me, let me just put that there. It says most of the time there's one month difference. And you can calculate without being there when rabbinical time is going to be, because there's rabbinical time here. It's going to be this moon, and that's just a straight astronomical calculation. So what the Millerites do is say, most of the time, the Karaites are one month afterwards. And it's as simple as that. That's the argument that they use. They say, we're just going to go one month afterwards. So they, when, when they come up with this date here, they're not, do, they're not doing any sighting of 
the barley harvest in Israel, they're just using this piece of logic here. That they're saying most of the time the Karaites are one month afterwards and that's how they're defined 19th of April. Wasn't there after so many decades a certain pattern that could be recognised like uh, of these delays that you could somehow was, see yeah. how these delays uh, would be in the future? There is. Um, and but but if you're going to do it if you're going to do it properly accurately you you can't you can't use that because you have to use the physical sighting it, you can't you can't just base it upon a mathematical calculation if you're going to do it if you're going to be technically correct but the millerites just override all of that logic that in a 19 year cycle you're going to get 7 years and you're going to on average that's you're going to divide 19 by 7 and every two to three, every two stroke three years, you're going to have this extra leap year coming in. They, they skip over, all over that and they just say, most of the time there's a one month difference and that's the primary logic that they're going to use. Oh. Was 1843 also a year where they had this extra year? The uh, Millerites, month? well, the, the Millerites are going to put that extra month in. The Millerites are going to say that 18... 43 is a leap year where they have uh, a VR there and they're going to put that extra month in but no one else is doing that and Not that's this the argument Karaites. sorry Not even the, Karaites. the whole issue about the Karaites and and they and and who and what they are and how they think gets really muddy I haven't been able to to go back and really do you know some research on that history but some of the people who argue against 1844 They'll give, they'll give you evidence to show you that the, um, that the Karaites were in apostasy around this kind of time and they're not a reliable source of information that even they had changed their opinion, that changed their views. And yeah, so I'm saying there's different views. Yeah, there's, there's whole different views on that. So I don't know exactly what a Karaite would be saying, but I know what the Millerites are saying. The Millerites are using all this logic and the logic that they use is that most of the time, and they'll use, they'll use statements like this, that in the cold spring of, of, uh, of Israel in March, that there's too much frost, that the lambs aren't going to be ready, and the barley won't be ready, and that you normally need to wait a month before that can happen. And most of the time you have to do that. And that's the logic that they use. They're not using the sighting, they're using just the logic. actually stopped using their system and kind of adopted the rabbinical method. Yeah. Um, at least I've read that from a couple sources. But so anyways, they weren't even they weren't like, It may well be, yeah. It may well be after eighteen forty five. I'm not hundred percent sure. No, it is. Yeah. I read it I've read it. Okay. I read it before eighteen forty five. I read it actually in in not even very long after they developed the system, they kept it for several hundred years and then they apostatized. So, so without getting into a discussion on that, the, point, the only point I'm making is my focus is not on what real-life Karite people are doing in this history, post this history, or even before this history. What we know is how the Karaites determined their time was according to biblical reckoning. So that's why we use that term, Karite reckoning. You know, we, technically, I guess we could call it you know, Moses' reckoning or God's reckoning, but we use that term because... That's the term that the Millerites use. We're picking up that term. And they know that the Karaites got their understanding of this way back from the books of Moses. And the Millerites are just going to do a really simple understanding of how you do it. They're just going to shift it one month into the future. And they're right. So basically what the Millerites did, they took their logic of how they would place their timing of the first day of the first month and they applied it themselves but they didn't actually take the reckoning of what the Karaites did in that year. Is that what I'm hearing you say? I haven't seen evidence that, you know, ca and which is what I said about 10 minutes ago. I don't know how a Karaite living anywhere in the rest of the world is going to get information from Israel in enough time to actually prepare for this day. Because you know, you're, you, you know it's going to either be this month or this month 
and you need to make sure that way back here that you know that the, which which month it's going to be and i don't know if you if there's enough if information can travel that fast but what i do know is the millerites didn't use that logic they didn't go to a real life carite and say show us how you doing uh, what are you doing this year they're just using simple logic to say most of the time there's a one year there's a one month difference and they just went with that there was not a system that said every five year we have an extra month and every five yeah. or every seven year and i think that's what brother gabriel was saying when we if you do the research now they say on average it was like that but if you're going to be technical about it, you can't do that. It has to be a physical sighting. This, this 19 year cycle, this is what I'm saying. That, that very thing that Gabriel said is what the Karaite Jews did like 9th century, 10th century. And that's what they started doing. They started going, well, hey, we can do some math and just kind of jump it a month every two or three years. And they did this whole complicated mathematical calculation. And I spoke to a Jew one time in the airport. And I asked him about this, and he said, nah, that's been done a long time ago, for this very reason, that they started using this 19-year, seven, you know, seven times in 19 years, every two, three, they did this huge formula, this kind of <coughs> formed it out, and that's what they did, and they, they leaned away from the barley sighting, which is what caused them to misidentify in 1844, September 23. Yeah. But they must also have, they, they came to April 19th. Not 18, not 17, not 21. So, so this is the next point. This is the next point, Sister Tiffany. Why? Well, I was just wondering, what, just to be clear, what calendar did they use to get to April and what calendar did they use to get to October? And who's they? The Millerites? Yeah. Okay, so let's, let's address that issue. Now, we're speaking about these moon cycles. If you're supposed to be doing it according to Moses' his rules, where are you supposed to cite the moon? You have to be doing this in Jerusalem. Okay, so you have to live it, you have to be in Jerusalem. There was a special place in Jerusalem, near the, near, in the temple precincts, I think it was, where they do these moon sightings. So you've got, you've got two issues. If you're going to do this properly, you have to have a field near Jerusalem and you have to site in Jerusalem. And now you begin to see where the problems are because you can't do a sighting in Jerusalem and, tra and get that information around the world quick enough. Again, the Millerites, they just skip over all of these problems and what they're going to be doing is, what's, what's the most famous city for, for the Millerites? What's, what's the premier city that they, it's not, it's not New York. Boston. Boston. Mm. So I'm not going to say this, don't misunderstand, well I'm going to say it, but don't misunderstand it. Boston is their Jerusalem, yeah? Don't misunderstand me. They're not, they're, this is not their, like their, their Mecca or something. Everything's focused around Boston. And you know that this is the fifth day of the fourth month where everything kicks off, and it kicks off in Boston. Lots of things happen in Boston. Boston's an important place. When they do these calculations, they're going to calculate from Boston. They're not going to calculate from Jerusalem. So when they're going to do their, their moon sightings, the Millerites are doing their moon sightings from Boston, not from Jerusalem. So when you start seeing this, you begin to realise that this idea that we believe, Daniel 1141, that the United States is the glorious land. Now, I don't think the Millerites used to think like that, but they're going to be fulfilling that, that prophetic role that they're going to start using Boston, I just say the United States, as Israel. They're going to, they're going to transfer all the rites and rituals from Israel, and then they're going to bring it all into the United States without explaining any of that. They just do that, and they're not saying this is what we're doing and this is the reasoning behind it. And 170 years later, we come up and we say, we think the United States is a glorious land, and look, that's what the Millerites were doing. Everything that they did, they did right. Just by coincidence, if we want to say that. And, and that's, part of the, that's part of the discussion that we're having about Millerites and how they understood this, all this issue on Daniel 2 and the relationship between the 7 and the 10. Did they just make some, did they just get it right coincidentally or is it all being set up so that when we come to the end of the world we can look back at their history and say they just got it all right without realising how they did it. You know, to me, 
if you've seen, you've seen the argument, I think we've discussed it in class, how William Miller got to the understanding of what the daily is. And we, we've spoken about that. And to me, I'm thinking, how would you do that? And is that really a robust sound defense of the daily compared to how we can defend the daily now? It just seems, it, to me, it seems really simplistic. And I think, I wouldn't want to go up, you know, in front of hundreds of people and defend the daily by just saying, took the word takeaway, went to Second, Thess Second Thessalonians, and, and there you go. But people accepted that. But you know the conclusions that they come to are all correct, even if they, they do it in a, in a way that you think, that you might cringe about. That they're going to say, let's take the moon sighting in Boston. Let's not even worry about a barley harvest. Let's just say it's a month later. They come to all the right answers, but the way they get there, I don't want to say they're dodgy, but they're, they're, they're really, they're different. So they're going to do their moon sightings in Boston. That's how they calculate April the 19th. There's a thing called an almanac, which is basically a calendar. It's a book and it tells you for this next year, what the moon's going to be doing when you get sunrise and sunset in any part of the country, any part of the world. It's all done electronically now, but they were doing, the government had, you know, were publishing books that told you, that told you all that. So you know way back in 1843, that there's a book that's going to tell you what this next year is going to look like in Boston. It'll have key cities. And in Boston, it'll tell you when the new moon is going to happen. So they know that when you get to April the 18th at night time, sunset on April the 19th, and they did a site in there, you could site it in Boston, that you could see the first sliver of the moon here on April the 18th in Boston, and that's where they fixed the date. So we talk about April the 19th, but it's sunset to sunset. Um, so if you go sunset on the 18th to sunset on the 19th, this is the first day of the first month. And because most of this day, this is the daytime and this is the night, is part of the 19th. That's why we've got, we have April the 19th, 1844. And I mentioned this before, then you already know this way back here, when you get to October the 22nd, at sunset on that day, what did they do? What did we say that they did? Yes, they switched, yeah, but they switched back to Roman time in their mind. Mm -hmm. Because, you know, when push comes to shove, all of us crumble under pressure. You, you're at October 22nd, sunsets come, and you're still on October 22nd, but now you're into the next day, aren't you? You're, technically, you're on to October the 23rd. By your, own logic. By your own logic. Christ hasn't come, and they sit there waiting until midnight. It shows you, for me, I find that really scary. You know, we, we think we understand all of this tr truth, and we're going to stand firm on it. But when the punchline happens, how, much, how many of us are really going to stand? How many of us are going to crumble when things don't work out the way we think they are? We revert, yeah, we revert back to, which is the Roman way. Our old ways, all of us are fixed into Romanology. That's the word. So, April the 19th, they're going to get from the sighting of the moon in Boston. And once they do that, now they're going to calculate. Because they're predicting October the 22nd, way back, well, Samuel Snow is predicting it, way back earlier in the year. If we, if we just look at July 21st, by July 21st, he's... The calculations have been perfected and he knows how he's going to do it. So what he's going to do, he's going to go use the almanac and go, and he knows when all those moon sightings are going to be. You just go to October and it's a straightforward calculation. It's easy to do. Just one other piece of information. When you get to October in Boston and you want to know when the first day of the seventh month is going to be, which is this first sliver, you can't even see a moon in Boston. There's no moon visible because of, the hist because of the geography of things. I don't understand all the dynamics of it. But in October in Boston, you can't even see a moon. So all of this is done by calculation. It's all done by calculation from the beginning right to the end. Say that again, in October? In October, in, if you live in Boston in October, you can't even see a new moon. It's, it's so low on the horizon, there's no new moon visible. So you could, you could never have done a sighting of that. 
So, you know, when we talk about the Jews having their sightings, it's, there's, there's some unique things about living in, in Jerusalem that you can do many things, literally, that you cannot do if you live in another part of the world. So if you live in Boston, you can't literally even see a new moon in October. It has to be done by faith, by calculation. So they're going to take a, the sighting of the moon from Boston. They're going to just go one month after this new moon here, which they can calculate. So they're going to go to here. So that's an assumption. And they're assuming that whatever you can do in Jerusalem, you can do it in, Bo you can do it in Boston. If this news got out into the public, people would be up in arms that our whole foundation is based upon these, the way the Millerites doing it don't seem right. And pe people even on this movement struggle with this because I've known people who, who say, no, they, they, they're going back to Jerusalem and they're looking at this body and they're getting this information and, and it's, that's not how they did it. They didn't do it that way. It, ta and everything, it takes faith for us because they were just boldly saying, this is the truth, this is it. Now, when we come back and we say, do we really believe all of this logic that the Millerites developed? And you've got 18 million people standing on October 22nd, 1844. And if, I think if people understood how they developed this logic and how fragile it is, maybe people would get really shaken. I had, and that's, that's why Ellen White has to be a test for us. Because if, you, if you're, how many Ventists don't, aren't firm on Ellen White? And all this gets swept away from them. I had a couple of hands. It shows you, it shows you God's providence. He used the resources that the Millerites could have had and still came to the same answer, to the correct answer. That's what I want to say, but I haven't been able to say it that way. Yes. Yes. He uses the resources that they have, the capabilities of 19th century Victorians. No computers, no, no, nothing of the information that they can't... They've got, he uses all of that and he comes up with the right answers. Using seemingly wrong methods. Yeah. William Miller doesn't have, doesn't have strong concordance. He doesn't have a computer to be able to do all these searching. So he uses a really simple way of doing it. He proof text in a way that, and we mentioned this in class, that he uses proof text in a way that we often don't realise. He's proof texting not the word, but words that surround the word, which is which people don't understand. And when he, when he does that, he's not even going to pick up word for word matching because they're actually different words that he's picking up from a crudence concordance. So, how, so when he does that, there, there are many, many changes or, or subtleties that he's using, but he comes up with the right answer over and over again. Oh. And how do we know that? How do we know that? Sister White. Sister White. It always, it's Sister White. It comes back to Sister White. But we're in the time of Jehoiakim where he's chopping up <laughs> her writings from 9-11 and, we're, 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 and if you discard her, you're in serious trouble. Uh, so I had a couple of hands up here, but Brother Tyler. Um, so when Miller, William Miller was proof texting, does he expound upon how we should proof text? Because I know if, if, I, came to, if I came to people, I'll just say, I'll say you, you know, I'm not yeah. necessarily you, yeah. but, and, I, and I did what William Miller did and I said, you know, daily, daily is not, or not even the same word as someone else. You'd say, well, what's the, what's the strong reference? Is it, it actually the same word? And then if, if I said, no, it's not, I was just doing it, you know, with the credence or something, you'd say, it's not even the same word. This is a totally different thing. Yeah. Um, or we would, as I know, because this discussion has happened yeah. before. We'll, we'll look and we'll say, oh, not the same word. Can't be the same thing. Does he expound upon that? Or was it a, a honest... Like Mike was saying, an honest, not mistake, but an honest understanding and with the help of Gabriel and God, he was able to still make correct conclusions. Should I, we proof text like William Miller or should we proof text with how, the, strong. with the uh, Strongs and things like that? As far that? as I know, all the only information we've got is his memoirs from Sylvester, Sylvester, Sylvester Bliss. And I think James White republishes that work later on. And it's just, it's just, it's just in passing. It's just like two sentences. And you, and you just miss it if you're not careful. But when you start thinking about it, the way he proof texts is really liberal. And w I'm suggesting that, you know, with the way we proof text, maybe we, we can be a bit more liberal. Because if we're, if we're so rigid about it, people say, well, that's not proper, proper proof text. You know, you haven't proved your argument well enough. And 
I think we use, you use the term wiggle room. Um, he has a lot of wiggle room in the way they do it. How much wiggle room have we got here? How do you, how do you, what authority do you say you're going to go from Israel to Boston and make this into the glorious land? They don't talk about the glorious land in, in the way we understand it. I know Hiram Edson does later on, but all of this information is embedded in their logic, this one month difference, everything, and they just say, it is as it is, and everybody accepts it. But today we have struggled accepting things. I had some questions, uh, hands up here, did anybody? I was going to say that the same thing happened with Josiah Litch. He came to that day, but he didn't, with calculations, he didn't actually, he just, however he did it, all I know is he didn't do it, but it ended up on the exact day. Yeah, the way, I was going to say that earlier, that the way that Josiah Litch cuts through all the calendars and the confusion, and gets to August 11, he jumps hundreds of years and just gets to July. He says, oh, July 27, add 15 days to that in our time. Doesn't account for any kind of shift or anything like that. Doesn't matter. Came to the right answer. But but he doesn't account for all that. And I, I know somebody personally who struggles with that and goes great lengths to explain how even the Karyat calendar and, and it explains how it's possible. But I don't think you need to. The, the, the shift that Brother Michael's talking about is when you go from Julian time or you know, Ro, uh, Julius Caesar, Roman time, to Papal time or Gregorian time, th th there's, there's a discrepancy of depending on which country you live, depending on when you're going to shift from one calendar to another. We talk about this 10 day shift, but it's not really 10 days, it depends. You're going to shift from, from a pagan Rome calendar to a Papal Rome calendar, and the calculations. The way the pagan Romans were doing it were inaccurate, so they have to make some correction. So there's this shift, uh, and some days are lost. There's all this argument, and that's what he's talking about, where you have to take account of all of that. And Josiah Litch spans all of that history and just ignores it and comes up with the right answer. Um, so what should this teach us about our message when we're accepting it for ourselves and when we're teaching it? Make it simple. It's a really simple message. Um, there's a lot of information, but sometimes we can, um, I, think it, I think it's an Australian term, you bamboozle people with, with so much information and, and people get lost. Saying that, my initial point that I wanted to make, there's a lot of information and please keep attentive when, because that information, that detail makes a big difference. And you've probably experienced this before, you do two hours of study and it's a 30 second statement in a study that you're going to give. And people don't realise, it just rolls off the tongue and they don't realise how many hours of research you need to do to do that. And it's the same thing when we, when we mark all of these names, dates and places, the only purpose for doing that is just coming to an end conclusion. But if you don't settle into those things, when the conclusion comes, it will look like an enemy is just coming attacking you. Um, I think one of the, the biggest problems with simplicity versus complexity in terms of giving a message is simplicity is always better, but a lot of times the simplicity shakes people. You know, like what you just explained would shake a lot of people. Yeah. It's very simple. You know, it, 30 minutes and you know, that's fine. Um, and that's just what they did. But sometimes in the simplicity they say, am I going to put my faith or am I going to stand on this simplicity? You know, and even if there's a lot of research behind it, you know, Millerites are a good example of that. There's still some, there's still some uh, unaccounted for work in there, I guess. I agree, but I'm not sure how much extra information I could give on this, but if we're going to talk about the daily, now, when we talk about daily, we've got a lot of research. We can, we can you know, a thousand times fold information from what the Millerites understood about daily. But when you start giving that, I think you get to the opposite place, the, the other ditch, people say, information overload. Yeah. I'm not interested in this, just give me the answer. Mm -hmm. And so if it's simple, they won't accept it. If you give all the, all the proof, they don't accept it. And I say they, and, and the they is us. Yeah. You know, the they, depending on what your issue is, you know, we, we all say we like the daily, but you might have some other issue somewhere, and all of us are stuck in this problem, that somewhere along the line, 
if we give it simple, we get a problem. If we give the details, we get a problem. So you need to think about that as you're teaching and as you're accepting these things. This, this whole discussion, you know, we talk about a prophetic test. This prophetic test change challenges, you, challenges your character. And this is the very mechanism that God's using to find out who is, who is his people and who are not his people. And I think I said this right at the beginning when I was talking about the visions. Part of the understanding that I have about the visions is, is I know there's a couple of hands. If we put midnight, midnight cry, and this is the third way, Mark, and the second and the first, the 9-11, and we're going to put the Marea and the Marah vision down here, and this is where you start, I'm saying this is the Hazon. I put C for Hazon vision. And this Hazon vision is number two. And number two is where you exhibit righteousness, not number three. I think our focus is, is, is for some people, has shifted so far into this history that we're waiting for something to happen. And we mustn't do that. We mustn't wait for this event to occur because this is where you're going to have perfection. And this perfection is all going to be happening in the Hazon vision. If I can put the, ho the ho Hazon vision time period, and this Hazon vision is what we're talking about now. It's how you grapple and relate to the Word of God through these histories here, these prophetic histories. However, way, however you want to describe it, whether it's Esther, Ruth, all of this, and it challenges you and your concept and at the bottom line, I think it's to do with faith. Are you going to believe all of this numbering and this frag the fragility of all of this, and you're going to stand on this? And if you don't, can't stand on it now, you're not going to stand on it then. And most, of, not, some of us, I, get, I, I worry, are waiting for this time to stand and saying, forget all the detail, let's get to the conclusion. And this is where each of us are being refined and tested. And in just this diagram here, this is a problem that, this is the coup d'etat, there's going to be a coup d'etat here, or the punchline, and you're going to miss it if you don't sort it out here. Um, Brother Gabriel, I had a couple of hands. Brother Gabriel at the back. Just a curiosity, you know, I'm wondering, if, if there were almanacs of the moon cycle uh, of the city of Boston at that time, there certainly are some of the city of Jerusalem. I'm just wondering if the I don't think they do. You can, you can do that calculation now. You can go into the NASA website and I, forgot, I can't remember all the details. If you, if you put in NASA, um, I think the Naval Observatory, I think it's the Naval Observatory, some people may be familiar. You can do all that calculation online. There's a nice little program that does it. And you'll see, I think, I think there's a day shift here. Um, the problem with this is that if this is a new moon, let me put a new moon here, and it's all black, then when you get to the next bit and you get the first sliver, now you might not be able to see that sliver because technically you're not supposed to use binoculars or telescopes, it's supposed to be a, a normal sighting. So you might have to wait the next day when that sliver gets a little bit bigger When, it's, when it gets a little bit bigger to that. So when, when you go into the Naval Observatory uh, website and you do this, it will show you blow by blow as this thing is growing bigger. Now the question is, it will call this something like zero and it says 0 0.1, 0 0.15, then 0 0.2. So you and I would, be, would have a discussion. When can you see it? Can you see it at 0 0.1 or 0 0.15? And that's why you'd have two or three priests doing all of this work for you. But the Millerites escape all of that technicality. They just go to their Boston Almanac and they say, the new moon's going to be on, uh, I think it's the 17th. Yeah. And it's 17th? Yeah, it's the 17th. Um, and then they go the next day, you're going to be able to, and then the next day you can actually see it. So they quote in the passages, the next day there, there, there was an hour and a half or something like slot just after sunset where you could see they say the new moon, but they mean this sliver. You can see the first sliver. So they, they had a sighting in Boston to confirm this, and they used an almanac. But, but they're not going to even go to Jerusalem. 
was, were the almanacs available for Jerusalem? They probably were. But they're going into Boston, into the glorious land. So they're, they're already trying to teach us right back here of what the glorious land is. So when we come to Daniel 11 verse 40 and 41 and we start arguing in the church what the glorious land is and there's so many people who argue it, Millerites are already have this truth embedded into their message. Um, I had a couple of fans. Sister Tanya. One thing that I've come to understand, the first angel's message, you are giving a new mind, the mind of Christ. And you know that if your thoughts are right, your words are right, your actions are right. On the second angel's message, you're giving the life to exhibit that mind of Christ. That's right, yeah. So what's first in the heart is going to come out. Is that what you're saying? No, what's first oh. in the mind. Yes. The mind is the most important thing because your mind basically sets the heart. But the heart, the heart is basically a new heart, means getting a new life. Because yes. You, the Lord says you cannot change your heart, you need a new heart. And on the second angel's message, we know that that's where the, the breath is breath in you. It's breath uh, blown in you, right? And that's when you're giving the life to exhibit the mind of Christ. Okay, so you're saying here's the new mind and there's the, here's the new heart. Yes. Yes. Yeah, I like that. Yeah. So by the time you get to the third test, you're ready to stand because you've already passed. So l let me put that there. You're given a new mind. New mind. And yeah, you're saying a new heart. Yes. So maybe we think about that. Brother Colin. No, I was just going to say regarding the Millerite and how they understand stuff. That's, I, I, I have a similar thing. I go with the strongest argument. So I have no, I have no issues with studying something again. But my point is this. If you can find me an argument, like, so, like the daily or something, find me an argument that's stronger than paganism. If you can't, then you just can't. <coughs> so I think the Millerites are the same thing. We're going to be held accountable to the light that we have. <coughs> the light that we have is the strongest argument we can concoct or formulate given the resources that we have. We're not going to dot it across every T. I think Ellen White says the Lord leaves hooks for us to hang our doubts on. So we have to just put together this, because that's what the Millerites done. They couldn't, they couldn't concoct a better argument than what they had from the Bible. Hence, they couldn't see any error in what in in, in what they were doing in their uh, calculations. And I think we have to do the same. We, so going back and forth, and even with this Daniel too, and, and certain things, some people may see it as unhealthy. I see it as healthy. Me, me being at loggerheads with conference people over the daily, being at loggerheads with over the 2520, the glorious land, Daniel 11, that's made me go way deeper into, into the Bible and, and into these doctrines than I would have ever have gone had these challenges not come. I had a couple of other hands up. No? The other line of argument or defence about all of this, which we haven't discussed this week, but we're all aware, is Ezra 7, yeah? Mm. Ezra 7, that the first day of the first month, they're gonna mark this as April the 19th, and then you go and to the 10th day of the seventh month, and you're gonna get October the 22nd. And they're getting that from Ezra. So the additional piece of information that we have is what? Ezra is now present truth. And what, what did the Millerites, what had the Millerites missed in their understanding of Ezra 7? Tarrying. Not, 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 I'm not thinking about the tarrying. Starting off the, 33. the first day of the fifth month. Oh, yeah. they, they bring it up into, you know, in their conversation, in their flow of their thoughts, but they don't pick up the prophetic fulfillment of the first day of the fifth month. First, first day of the fifth month. So all of this logic that we have, that we say, well, just cross your fingers and just hope that the Millerites got it right. They're in Boston and everything was fine. We don't just have to rely upon that because what do we have? We've got August the fifteenth because this is the first day of the fifth month, and the Millerites missed this. When I mean they missed that. They understood in Ezra 7 
they developed a logic that they're going to get from the first day, the first month, to the fifth month, going to Jerusalem. It's going to take them a few weeks to organise themselves and get things ready until you get to uh, the tenth or the seventh month. That's one line of logic that they use. And the other line of logic, they say, at Christ's first advent, he's going to fulfil the spring feasts. Then at his second advent, he's going to fulfil the, uh, the full feasts. And so they use that, that second string of argument to get to October. But they miss this. Because this was for us. This was so that, you know, if you're struggling with Boston and it's a different moon and they're just saying in the, in the, the, there's, a, there's an issue here, it's all guesswork, that you don't have to just rely upon those Millerites making these assumptions. It's locked right into here. So this is, this is what helps us to confirm. It, it should, that's the whole point. It should confirm our faith that when they're using the first of the first month in Ezra 7, 9, and that's what made it present true for them, we have this date. Um, so that's where, I, for me, the anchor that all of this is correct, that you can really stand on this truth, and you're not just left to, to the whims of, 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 of these men when they selected these moons and these days. This proves it to be so. Uh, Sister Alison. If you answered my question, I was going to ask what date period did William Miller have with all of that understanding prior to April 19, 1844? It was around that time, the first day in the first month, but because they missed the August 15 until Samuel Snow came in and telling them that that was going to be the midnight prayer, right? Does my question make sense to you? No. Okay, I'm sorry. It's the best I can do. Okay, <laughs> so are, you are, you asking me a are you asking me a question or could it sound like a statement, which is no, fine? No, it is a statement because okay. you answered it with August okay. 15th, first day, fifth month, um, that they missed that point when they were expecting, I think, the Lord to return with the first disappointment at April 19th based on these moons. Yes, the so, calendar that they so, got. so if I understand what, you, what, what you're saying correctly, if I understand correctly what you're saying is, they go, I'll just do it here. If, if, we put, if we just put this asunder as our time, they know this point here, and they're going to go right from here and skip to here. And this history here of the midnight cry, the first day of the f fifth month, they just sort of gloss over. Now, they know something happens in August, so they know that, but they don't go back to Ezra and tie that piece of information together. So this was for them, but, but this is the date for us. This is for the... 144,000, this is for the Millerites, and it's the same passage. Mm -hmm. uh, Brother Tyler. Um, all I was going to say is that midnight is another good example of a confirmation, because you have Samuel Snow saying, today's midnight, you know? Yes. Confirming the same thing like August 15th. Yes. So, yeah, so I've, I've only mentioned here from Ezra 7, but we've got testimony of two, because we just don't have the first or the fifth month, we've got the fifth day of the fourth month. So this is from the book of Ezra, and this is from the book of, my slips me. No, this is not Ezra, that's Ezra. This is Ezekiel, that's why I lost it. So this is Ezekiel chapter one, verse one, and this is Ezra seven, verse nine. So we have two dates, July 21st and 15th of August. Brother Michael. This is why it says that the midnight cry is the light that's set up behind the advent band and it shines all the way to heaven. And that's the midnight cry. Yeah. You know, so that's, it is especially for us and, and, and it was a significant event for them. But like you're saying, to tie it in, it sheds light, it helps us immensely. Yeah. I, I, haven't, I haven't spent the time to, to really think about this or, or to explain it well, but you know, this is so important to us. I don't think we realise how important it is for that, for that very idea that, you know, her vision where she says this sheds light on everything that's about to happen. And so just as we're, we're, we're every, where the light's about to be switched on, it's going to shed light on everything that's about to happen, we have this huge fallout in our movement. Everything seems to go wrong at the very time where everything begin is beginning to be explained. So I think everything that we're talking about over the last 12 months, is all to do with this midnight cry, and it's shedding light upon the future. All of it, everything that we're talking about. Uh, Sister Tanya. I wanted to point something out that I've never really thought 
too much about it, but when Brother uh, Joseph Bates was going on to the camp meeting, extra camp meeting, he was told, uh, impressed upon his mind there was going to be a new light there. Yes. But when he got there, there were several tents. And he went from tent to tent asking, is there a new light? Yeah. So that's probably something that's going to happen during our time. There's going to be different meetings. And yet the meeting will only come from one tent. That's a nice point. And he knows which, and he gets, and it, I, don't, I don't know if he knows, but he ends up being in the right tent. Well, he kept asking you one Yeah. Is this right here that he went from tent to tent? Then but, he says, is there, is there a new light? And, and somebody says, have you gone to Exeter tent? There's new light there. Hmm. Somebody pointed him there. It, it's funny, you know, when those stories are related, sometimes they come out of sync because he's already in the tent before the new light's given. Yeah. He was right. at the pulpit. But the way he explains, the, what that, that, the way that passage is written, it's almost like Samuel Snow's there giving this new light and Brother Bates is looking for which tent to go in. But Brother Bates is already there right. and there's no new light in that tent. In fact, that's part of the problem that everybody's actually tired of what he's talking about. But when you think about it, how many men would be willing to step down when somebody's saying, you know, hey brother, we've already heard that message. We have a new brother and he has a new light. Would you be willing to kind of step down and let him go up there and talk? Yeah. And because he was already given the forewarning, there's going to be a lot. He was humble enough to step down and say, okay. Especially if it's his sister saying it. <laughs> He's got a family connection. I thought he was Samuel Snow's sister. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. It's Samuel Snow's sister. But he wasn't related to Joseph Bates. No, I mean, especially when I say his, I mean, oh, yeah. if your family member says, can you come down and let my brother speak? Yeah. It's a bit... <laughs> It's even more, I'm saying it's even more humbling because my brother's a better speaker than you are. So, any, any, did you have your hand? Yeah. Yeah, Mari and Mara. This okay. is uh, Jerome's question, but I'll throw it in because he kind of swayed me. Why you, Who's is Jerome? Jerome, man. Nobody else knows who Jerome uh, is. Jerome from the UK. Okay. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah it's, uh, nobody knows who Jerome is. Yeah. He's true historian, <laughs> Yeah. A brother from the UK. The Mari. Is the fall as one dead, and the Mara is the appearance. No, the Mara is the appearance. The Mara is falling one is dead. That's mm -hmm. what I just said. Okay, so is that what you said? It's the <laughs> accent. It's the accent. Oh, sorry. So <laughs> let me get. Let, let's let's get this thing. So the Mara yeah. is the appearance. Yeah. Okay. And the Mara are. And the Mara are is uh, I put looking glass. Okay. okay, you want to put dead. Yeah. yeah? So that's the experience. But, but, but no if we say e. looking glass. No E, right? Mm -hmm. It's M A R H. Oh, yeah, yeah. M A R H. That's it. Yeah. A R. Yeah. So let me put a, a dash here. Mara -mar and Mara. R mm -hmm. and A. Yeah. <coughs> yeah? So we should put your. Why? Is that a question or a point? Question. Why does a uh, Mara come before the. Mere. Because the, to my, in my head, the way I'm kind of computing it, is that you, you, you first see, you first have an appearance, and then the, the mara is almost like you get, you, you, you kind of come into that appearance and, and, and you experience the appearance. I thought the mara was before the mara. Right, that's what we exactly. always thought. That's We've always correct. talked that the mara comes first. The, so the, the mara comes first. What I forget to notice is you, you have all these questions which are always off topic. Yeah. Okay. But I don't mind. It's, it's on topic because you, you say <coughs> day, because you're saying the midnight cry is our thing. Okay. It's our like anchor and, 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 and it's our thing. Without getting into the technicalities of which one comes first and which one doesn't, one thing I do want to say is, <clears throat> if you do a study on these visions, is that when we say this is the appearance of Christ and this is the response that we get, that's true enough, but it's not that straightforward. Because in other, in other verses where it talks about the Marah vision, it's not talking about your response. It's actually talking about a real life vision that you're going to get. So one thing I want to say is, when we talk about the Marah vision, this one here, the looking glass vision, uh, it means different things at different places. And you have to see the context of what it means to see what it's talking about. It's teaching you different truths. That's, that's what I mean. That one symbol, if we're going to make it a symbol, it's teaching you different things. Because when you go to... Um, I, was, I was thinking, that, is it Numbers 12? Uh, 
When you go to Numbers 12, it, it doesn't talk about you're going to fall to the ground and be prostrate when it talks about uh, the it has It has a different connotation. Or when you go to Ezekiel, it has a different connotation. So I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna I was gonna get Brother Tyler to answer because he because he he did that presentation in September, I think it was last year. Um, but he's not here. So I'm not gonna address which one comes first and why and whistle. But I just wanna say it's not just that every time you see the Mirage vision, you're gonna be collapsing to the floor. There's more truth about that vision than just that truth. Um, so that's what I wanna say about that. Are we ever going to attack? Oh, Brother Tyler's here. No, actually, we'll leave it for another time. Unless you know straight up. Brother Tyler, the, when, you, when you get to... Um, I've, I just put M here. I, I, and the reason I did that was deliberately. I just put the, uh, the Maria and the Mariah visions just as a 1M. Because I didn't want to get into the intricacies of this. To try and... Because I was preempting his question, which I didn't even know he was going to ask. But he asked it anyway. Is, he's asking... The order of these two visions, the Maria and the Mara vision, what's the order of them according to your understanding, it midnight to midnight cry? Maria, you have to see Christ first and then you respond to Christ. So I would put, like, just the way you have it, one and two. One and two. And we're going to put this way at midnight? At midnight. And it, it goes through, yeah. And then mm -hmm. the Mara goes through. It's also midnight. If they're both midnight. It's tech, they're both midnight. Yes. They're both midnight cry because it depends how you're looking at it. But, but, but the tech. Yeah. yeah so, so, so you're going to see Christ, yeah. then you're going to have a response at midnight, and that response it takes you all the way through <coughs> yeah. midnight cry. That's why I understand. Okay. Can see Christ. And you can yes, see. Yes. 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 So, so they're both. Okay. So, I'll, I'll put this then. So that's my wrong. That, that you see both of them at midnight, and you're going to continue seeing Christ through to midnight cry, mm -hmm. and you're going to continue to have this response. So that's all I needed to know okay. because Ezekiel 1, verse 1 is a Morah. Right, and it was the fifth day of the fourth month, which was midnight. So I'm scratching my head saying, well, why is the experience before the appearance? Well, if we're saying that it's both. Okay, so that was straightforward uh, then. Do, do, do. Yeah. The Mare vision kind of falls under the second test because it's a visual test. There are these, there are these other difficulties, especially when I look at. Isaiah chapter 6, because it seems to merge all of these things together. Six, Isaiah 6 for me gets a bit complicated, because one minute you're over here, and one minute you're over here, and it's not even any, in, in any sequential order, I think. I think Ezekiel 43, there's a verse in there that actually you have four Mara and one Mara. And if you really go into the details of it, you, you would have to be able to see better the visual test and then the, the, what it actually creates in you. And if you want to take it even deeper, take it, go to the Mara waters that the children of Israel came, tested at the first test when they came out of Egypt, the bitter waters. And at a spiritual level, you can combine those two because of the bitterness that creates in you. So I thought all of that was going to take five minutes, but it's taken most of the class. Um, five minutes left. Yeah. <laughs> so it's the other way around. What I want to do... Um, a while ago, Elder Jeff began all of this discussion um, by taking us to Daniel 7, Daniel 8, Daniel 11 and Daniel 12 and he laid out all of these dates. Um, what was the purpose of all of that? So let me just sort of sketch it in type. Can you repeat that part? Yeah. He went Daniel 7, 8, 11, and 12. And you also Revelation, um, Revelation 13 and 17 and 12 and put together all the dates. So, the yeah, so there were just loads of way marks all along here. The history of Rome. Mm -hmm. So what was the purpose of that? Was it not the time of the end? Was it time for the period? Yeah. So, I think it was a, I would think it was an emphasis on Rome. It was or it wasn't? It wasn't an emphasis on Rome because of some background. Did you say was or wasn't? Was. Was, okay. So you're agreeing with that? Uh -huh. The history of Rome. <coughs> Sorry, I, I, my, my hearing's not that good. Um, what else was it showing us? 
Okay, so what I want to do is, one of the things I want to, I want to, I want to go back to that and just lay that out and, 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 and redo it in class to make sure all your notes are okay. And we, and we actually see the purpose of what that, that was. Um, so that's part of the thing that I want to, that I mentioned right at the beginning, that I think some of this stuff has been laid out and we've not fully appreciated the reason why it was even brought up in the first place. Um, as opposed to just showing the connection between these and where all of these times and dates and places go. So I wanted to do that. And the other... Go? No, go ahead. If I remember correctly, I, I think it's, it's what Aryan is saying. Um, he was showing us that on each line, each one of those was a witness to point to the... I think it was 1798, if I remember. Okay. So it, it takes... Good. So to separate the kingdom of God and the kingdom of Satan. So, so some of us are picking up that point. So it takes you to 1798 and then it also takes you to 1844. And you begin to see this, this whole setup between the relationship between the Marah vision and what Christ is going to be doing in his response to all of this history. Um, some of us, I don't think, have picked that up. So I want to just go through that again and just re repeat it in class. Um, and the other thing I want to do, I had a quick look at... It, it's happened a few times, but there was one, there was one study that, that, that he, it began here and the purpose for that was to go back into Daniel 2. That was the purpose of it. Yeah. So that, that's what I'm saying. That you, 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 set, you set everything up so that when you give the punchline, it doesn't end up into a coup d'etat. Um, so I want to go back into that so that we have a punchline and not, and not, and not a, a coup when we do that. The other thing I want to do, so I'm just showing you where I want to go in the next days and probably hopefully by the end of this week. I want to go into, back into Daniel 2 and look at the stone and the threshing floor and, and just some of that imagery. It's something that we've not spoken about in class that most people, some people here may be familiar with it, some people may not. Um, I think you had that 14 page notes that were given over the weekend when, when I wasn't here. Uh, and I've had a quick look at that, and, some of the, and so there's some reference in there that, that deal with this issue. Um, so I, I'm sh I presume Elder Jeff is going to go through that in the devotions, in the evenings, in the evening classes. But I want to go through that, that's what I want to tackle, is you get this mountain, you get to the statue, the stone's cut out, and then everything switches to a totally different, totally different symbols. But it's the same story. We, we know it's the same story, yeah? So Daniel 2, you have a mountain and you have a statue. A stone's cut out of the mountain, it destroys the statue. But then in the, in the rest of the chapter, towards the end, it switches that whole uh, picture to a threshing floor and a man who you don't see with a threshing instrument that threshes something that you don't see. And then there's this wind and there's, there's, there's lots of bits and pieces. I just want to go through that so that we're all on, we all understand what those verses mean. And I've run out of time, but I did say that we'd look at Daniel 11, verse 30. So tomorrow, I'm going to look at, I want to look at Daniel 11, which we've missed. But when we do Daniel 11, verse 30, uh, I'm going to just try and go through these histories first, because this ties you up to Daniel 11, verse 30. So... If there's, yes, questions. Any questions that we've got on what we've spoken about today? Yeah, I just... Can you just make it <coughs> simple and just tell me what they used to get April? Maybe it was both. Maybe I missed it. Okay. They used the Karaite Reckoning to get to April, and then they used the same Karaite Reckoning to get to October 22. Okay, so do, what they're going to do is this. They're going to say the rabbis are going to go to spring, the Vernon Lake and Ox, and they're going to hit the first new moon that's closest to that. They're going to pick up an almanac. 
are going to look through that, go to the city of Boston, and they're going to see when is the nearest new moon that's going to occur in Boston for this year, 1844. And then they're going to say, we know, this is where they make this assumption, that the Karaites are always a month later. So they're just going to pick the next month. So when they pick the next month, it's going to take them to April the 18th at night time, sunset. April the 19th, sunset, they, they make this comment that you can actually see a new moon in Boston that day. So it's a confirmation that everything's okay. So that's all done. So that's how they're established. Yeah. So that's how they establish that. Yeah. Then they're going to go through that same almanac and they're going to go through, because it's already, it's already laid out, they're going to count six months into the future. So by the time you get to the seventh month, which is October, I think it's the, something like the 12th, 12th, is it the 12th of the night going into the 13th of the day, I think. They're going to hit the 12th of October and they're going to know, they, they know that on the 12th of October, they're going to expect a new moon in Boston. And they're saying that right at the beginning in the spring of the year. And they're getting that from their almanacs. From the almanac, singular. So that's the first day of the seventh month. Okay, on the first of the seventh month, you've got this situation happening here. And that was in Boston and that's recorded in the almanac. Yes. <coughs> and so they're going to count ten days and you get to the 22nd, which I think is the 21st stroke 22nd. The 21st at night time. Mm -hmm. If that confuses you... No, you, no, I, oh, I okay, you understand. Okay. What's confusing me is that um, they're just... Like, the barley and stuff, it has, they, 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 it has nothing to do with the barley then. They just went six months? In, no, no. <laughs> let me, let me, so let me get... When, you, when you're living in Israel, real life, yeah. okay, you're going to know, you're going to factor in the barley. Yeah. Okay. Most of the time... You have to skip one month, yeah. a lot of the time. Uh -huh. So when the Millerites are looking at this, they're going to say, we're not going to look at literal barley. We're just going uh, to assume, if, I, if that's the best way I can say it. We're going to assume that when the rabbis say you begin here, the Karaites are going to add another, another month on because that's what they do most of the time. Yeah. So that's why they're going to go that. So they're using the logic of the barley, but they're not doing a real life sighting of the barley. So all the, all the reasoning and all the principles and all the logic is already there according to how the law tells Moses to begin their year, but they're not doing it literally. I don't know if we can even just say they're doing it symbolically, but maybe, maybe it's, it's a stretch to say that. But that's where they're going to add this in. And they're doing it all in Boston, which is in the wrong country, literally, but it's in the right country symbolically, that's, that's for sure. Yes, and, and you can do that. You can do that calculation of uh, they talk about the twenty nine and a half days. Um, it would, it would be, be times six, or would it be times seven? seven days. Yeah, so you get one hundred seventy seven plus the ten, which is one hundred eighty seven. And if you look at that table that or that calendar that uh, Brother Noel did, that's you get this. I think you actually get one hundred. You get one hundred eighty. You get one hundred eighty seven. I think it is. It's one hundred eighty seven days. So they talk about doing this calculation. Oh, because it's 29, 30, 29, 30. So they just take the average. Okay, gotcha. Yeah. Which is what it actually is. It is actually 29. Yes, yes. 29.5 something. Switched it to 29, 30 because 29.5 is weird. Well, no, you have to switch it to 29, 30 because you can't have half a day. You have to go, you go sunset, sunset. One month will be 29, one month will be 30. You have to do that. You're forced to do that. Sister Sarah. So the Dakariates always observe the moon at the beginning of a month or just at the beginning of the year? Yeah. That's so this is a, this is a question that, that many people struggle with. I think when, when you go right back into ancient Israel and, you know, 
they're an independent nation and they're, doing, they're living in accordance with God's will. They'd be doing these sightings every month. I think that's how, they, it's, that's how it's supposed to be done. It's supposed to be done as a sighting. And you'd blow a trumpet at the beginning of each month and then on the seventh month, um, you have the Feast of Trumpets, so they're going to blow this trumpet to, to tell you that you've come to that time period where you're going to get the uh, Feast of Trumpets, the Day of Atonement. It's a verse that that. Yeah, so I think they do a literal sighting every month, but it just gets railroaded or derailed, and they're just going to do it by calculation. So the Millerites are going to do all of this by calculation. How it gets from that literal sighting to these calculations through the centuries for me, is a bit of a black hole. But I know, what, I know what they did originally, and we know what the Millerites did. So the Millerites are going to do this calculation, work it out to be that, and they're using the almanac to, to rely upon because you can't even see a new moon in Boston. There's some unique things about living in Jerusalem, some, some specific things, that you can't keep feasts unless you live there. As soon as you leave Jerusalem, you, 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 you have massive problems. Um, you can't keep a feast, and that's, that's one of the issues that people who keep feast days, I don't know how they, I don't think they, they wrestle or grapple with those things. Yeah, they use their own calendar. Um, I don't think they, I think they become disingenuous something. They, they don't follow through with their own principles and rules where you're going to take some things literally and some things symbolically. Because as soon as you leave Jerusalem, you can't track things properly. You can't do things properly. You have to be, it has to be based around someone who's living in Jerusalem. There are people. Some people, some people yeah, with and do that. So the Millerites understood all of that issue and they just sway through all of the rubbish and just say, we're just going to look at what happens in America because that's where all this movement's happening. And they do it correctly because it's the glorious land. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your loving kindness and your goodness towards us. Father, as we experience the joy and pleasure of studying your word and understanding your mission, it reminds me of John the Baptist. Father, his life was one of toil and hardship and of misery at many times. And the only thing that made him happy, the only pleasure that he found in life was meditating upon your word in relationship to his message. Father, as we see this world collapsing all around us, as we see friendships being formed and friendships being broken, as we have struggles in our own personal lives, in our families, with our brethren and sisters, Lord, the only thing that really can make us truly happy is as we understand our work and our mission. And we can't understand that, Father, unless we understand your word. Please be with us and bless us through this day as we endeavour to serve you in spirit and in truth. May our hearts and our, mind, and our minds engage in this work faithfully, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.